Number one is personal recognition of diverse temptations of believers. Now, if temptation comes to you, and you don't recognize, you don't recognize this is temptation, how are you going to resist? How are you going to place it in the right pigeonhole and say, this one is not for fun, this one is not entertainment, this one is not, you know, people trying to get my attention. This is temptation. And it is when you recognize that, when you realize that, Personally, in your life, you have this personal recognition of the diverse temptations of believers. That's when you overcome, you will overcome. In 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. It looks like those Christians in the early church, they were not uh, just superficial Christians. They were not no so-so Christians. They were real Christians. Look at what uh, the apostle is saying. He's saying, wherein ye greatly rejoice. You greatly eh, rejoice. How is it that, you know, Christians today, Pentecostal Christians, Evangelical Christians, and Latter-day Christians, any little water of the pond that splashes on them, they begin to cry. They begin to fast and pray. Any little frown of anybody, eh, they begin to cry. Eh, what's happening to me? Why should this happen to me? Any little slander any little thing that people do against them they say me of all people why should they do this to me and their joy is gone it says for those believers who are there then and for the believers who are living in the end of time it says wherein he greatly rejoiced though now for a season it's all for a season it's all for this period the temptation will not be forever the temptation will not be for you know a lifetime it says don't now for a season for a period if need be here in heaviness heaviness that's heavy weight of temptation heavy load of temptation this thing is heavy this one is almost crushing all the same, he greatly rejoice because it comes through manifold temptations. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith. Okay, that's, that, that's why that thing came. We're in the faith. We're living in the faith. We're growing in faith. We're progressing in the faith. And Satan does not like people having faith in God, implicit faith in God, total faith in God. Because of that, he sends his cohorts. He sends his people that he'll bring that temptation. It says the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold. It says gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire. It says, uh, you know, sometimes the temptation, the trial is like fire burning. And have you ever seen people who rejoice when they're in the fire? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because the Lord Jesus Christ Emmanuel was them. And whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, whatever the difficulty or the trouble, they can rejoice in the Lord. It says it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 8, it says in verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love okay so this one is talking about believers like us because peter saw the lord and james uh, saw the lord and john and draw of them all those 12 they saw the lord but these are people now like you you have not seen the lord in the physical and yet you know he saved my soul 
I know he's real. I know he's there. I know he lives and he ever lives. Though we have not seen him, yet we love him. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This year will be a year of joy. When the rain is falling, you'll have joy. When there's no rain but sun is shining, you will have joy. When people smile at you, you will have joy. I lost a good amen. amen. And when people frown at you, you know, in the past years, you couldn't bear the fury of Nebuchadnezzar, the frown of unbelievers, because they don't agree with the way you're living for God and you're committed to God and you're doing everything you ought to do. And anytime they are coming to show that they are not happy, they're not happy you're a Christian, they're not happy you're a believer, they frown at you and they're furious. And then you lose your joy in the past, in the past. But today, we'll keep that joy. You will keep your joy. It says, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, wherefore, let him that thinketh a standard take heed, lest he fall. It says, because temptations come. Don't just walk blindly and then overconfident, self-confident, as if there's no problem, there's no problem, whatever. If I fall, I will rise. Don't live a careless life like that. It says, whosoever thinks he stands, let him take heed, let him fall. In verse 13, it says, there has, there has no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. That's the first thing to, to, to think about. About. That's the personal thing you think about every time temptation comes. There are other people on earth. This one is coming to you have trouble. Maybe in your marriage and the husband is, you know, talking like this, talking like that. You don't go into a corner and then say, I don't think I will be going to a Sunday fellowship. I don't think I'll be going to church. Because look at my, the way my husband is talking. It happens to other wives, other places too. It's not something peculiar, something so special. And look at the way they're treating me. It happens to other people too. And many of those people, they overlook those things. They don't allow all those things to overwhelm them. Will the rest of the people be stronger than you are? It happens to, you know, even teenagers and they overcome their, their kind of classmates and their colleagues and everything just like them. They call them names too. They make fun of them too. They poke at them too. And yet they overcome and they still continue their studies they don't say i will not go to school because at the play field this is what they said against me if those young people are able to overcome i can overcome i can overcome because there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man but god is faithful who will not suffer you permit you, allow you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, will the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. You'll be able. You'll overcome. You'll have the victory. And you will not be falling every time and cringing every time and fearful every time and backsliding every time. You know, there are, they call themselves Christians on Sunday, they are charged in the church. On Monday, maybe they are charged in the church. By Tuesday, they go back to those same situations and what they were charged about and the excitement they had on Sunday or Monday or maybe Thursday as they go back to the office and go back to their community during the week they fall again and then they come back their battery is always going down their battery is always uh, losing its power but for us who understand that the lord stands by us and he stands with us in every temptation 
we overcome in Jesus' name. He makes a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Then in verse 14, it says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. These are temptations that people attract to themselves that people invite to themselves they have something in their heart and they have uh, you know this uh, lust and this desire and this covetousness to have to get rich by all means and because of that because of what they are pursuing and they cannot let go because of that they fall into a snare and temptation and into many foolish and hurtful lost desires which drown men in destruction and perdition it's not only money anything you are looking for in the world and you want it from the world and you you want these people of the world or even christian to give you by all means and you are passionate for it it's not the kingdom of God. It's not the gift of God. It's not the grace of God. It's not what God gives by himself. But you want that thing by all means. Whatever it is, it gets you into temptation. It gets you into compromise. Because I want that thing. And that man is the only one that can give me. And so whatever condition it gives and whatever I have to do, I want it from him. You will compromise. You want something from a woman, any woman. And you say, she's the only one that can give me. And I want it by all means. And I want her to say yes when I ask her for this. You are going to fall into temptation because you are so passionate. You are not passionate for heaven. You are not passionate for righteousness. You are not passionate for holiness. You are passionate I must have this and if she is you know delaying and of course the people of the world they know when you really really hungry for something passionate for something and you want that thing by all means and they will use it to bring temptation to you but when you hold everything with a loose hand if it comes praise the Lord if it doesn't come praise the Lord you will not fall into any temptation Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We're coming to number two here. Number two, we're looking at a prompt resistance of devious tempters at the beginning. Very important. At the beginning, if you see a little snake just coming to earth like a worm, at that beginning, you can crush that thing. You can put your, your boot on that thing, you crush it, and it's gone. But if you don't resist it and kill it at the very beginning, the thing begins to grow, continues to grow. That thing can turn to become a very dangerous, poisonous viper that can take your life. It's at the beginning of the temptation. Don't nurse the temptation. Don't wait for it to grow. And don't, uh, you know, I'm studying the temptation. And don't get interested in the temptation at the right time, at the first time. When that temptation comes, that the thing, the time to kill that temptation. We're looking at First Peter chapter five, and I'm reading from verse eight. In First Peter chapter five, we're looking at verse eight. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, that the tempter, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Who are the people he's going to devour? The people who are not sober. The people who are not vigilant. The frivolous. The careless. The carnal. The gambler. The gambler. They gamble for their lives. They're not serious about anything. You know, uh, you cannot be a, a, a jester. 
and then be an overcomer and you cannot be a superficial or serious person and overcome as the temptations are coming as the tempters and the temptresses are coming now the temptresses uh, you know every time we think of adultery fornication yes that's that's terrible but there are there are people that just want to gamble with your life or with your conviction and if you are the frivolous type if you are the superficial type it will even take you by surprise you are falling before you realize you are falling but if you are sober, if you are vigilant, if you are observant, if you know you have your soul to keep and you have your life to keep and every time you are watchful, that's the time we overcome. And when the beginning of that thing comes and a frivolous fellow, careless fellow, gambler, he wants to gamble with your eternal life, comes into your life and is, you know, wanting to have an hero it's at that beginning you say no it cannot be i'm not like you you are not like me it looks like you're superficial it looks like you're a man of the world a woman of the world and i have something that will take me to heaven and you want to take that thing away from me no way because i've committed consecrated everything to the lord that is the man that is the woman that overcomes be sober be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, look at verse 9. It says in verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You resist with all the energy of God. You receive with all the vigilance you've got. You receive with all the power that you've got. It says you receive steadfast in the faith. You are standing, you are steadfast in the faith, and you receive that tempter and receive that temptation. The tempters are devious, they're dangerous, they're crafty, they're evil. And if you don't understand, they'll take you on a ways. Whom resisted first in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at practical repentance of deadening temptations with brokenness. Deadening temptations. There are some temptations that deadening people. Not only that, they allure you into evil, entice you into evil, you become deadened to the voice of the Lord and the voice of the Savior and to the warning that he had given you, he had given us in the past. You know, when, when something happens and, uh, you know, the flesh is attracting that thing, the flesh is accepting that thing and it deadens your mind. You even forget all the warnings you have heard. You forget all the words of God that you have heard. You forget all the consecrations you have made. You forget all the things you have penned down and you have said, no, that will not happen again. I'll not give myself to that again. And then the temptress comes or the tempter comes or the temptation comes. You're dead in. You don't even have a feeling that anything is going on. We need, and if you are falling, if you have gone astray, we need practical repentance of dead need temptations with brokenness. You are broken, and you come to the Lord with a broken heart. It's not like, you know, okay, God, I'm sorry, and then you are smiling. I'm sorry I did that thing again. You're a loving God. You're a merciful. You're not broken. You'll do that thing again. You'll go that way again. You'll eat that thing again. You'll drink that thing again. Because you are not broken. And the repentance is not deep in your heart. The repentance is not deep enough for God to see that you are breaking away from that thing. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 9. It says now, I rejoice not that she were made sorry, 
thought, I rejoice because ye sorrowed to repentance. Ye sorrowed to repentance. You know, some people uh, ask, oh, what's the difference between the so-called salvation of today and the salvation of yesteryears? The, the difference is, you know, there are people, they hear about Christ and they say that's the gospel. They hear there's no repentance. They don't understand the evil of sin. They don't understand the perdition, the punishment that comes as a result of sinning. And so they just hear that Jesus down the cross of Calvary and you want to be saved where you raise up your hand. And they raise up their hands in their heart. They don't understand the evil is sinning. And then they say, we well, write down their name and then they go and born again and born again and then they go out the same temptations come from the people who want them to smoke marijuana or smoke whatever and they didn't have any understanding of real salvation although they claim to be saved they go back right into that thing. It's a woman of the world that approaches them in their office after they say they are born again. There is no understanding of the brokenness that a person ought to have. Because of that, they just fall. But those who got saved many years ago, like when we got saved, we understood that sin is evil. That sin is terrible. That if you live in sin and you die in that condition, you'll go to hell. And we had a clear picture of hell, of what hell was. We were broken and we cry. It's not the tears, it's the heart that we're talking about that is broken. We repented like that and we knew what repentance actually meant. That's why we've remained saved after all these many years. It says now, I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, for godly sorrow walketh repentance. That's true, repentance. You're so sorry that you did that thing. It's not that you, know, that you say you are saved and you are, you know, relating what you used to do. You are relating it with joy, with glee. You are telling the people, you know, I used to do that and men and women, I used to catch them. I used to do it this way and do it that way. And, and you're relating it with joy. It's like you're saying the good old days as a sinner. You have not repented. If you have repented, you have godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. We're looking at Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, we're reading from verse 16. This is the chapter where David prayed in repentance. And look at this. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. When a person is repenting, he has broken heart. He has sorrow in the heart. He says, how could I do that? This is shameful. This is terrible. This is going to earn me eternal punishment and judgment and the heart is broken and then you repent that's how to overcome those deadening deadening uh, temptations look at uh, Matthew I'm looking at chapter 26 you know the story already uh, Peter denied the Lord and eventually when Christ looked back at him look at verse 75 in verse 75 it says and Peter remembered the words of Jesus do you remember the words of Jesus in the office 
you remember the words of Jesus in your community? When you go to be with your people, your relatives that are not born again, even those who are born again, but maybe they are superficial, maybe they are the modern day believers that do not have the depth of understanding of the word of God. When you are with them, do you remember the word of the Lord? Do you remember everything you have learned and all the messages we have been hearing that will give us real conviction, fiery conviction? Do you remember when you get back home? Uh, Peter remembered. Actually, Peter remembered at the wrong time. It was almost getting too late. It was when uh, that lady said, you must be one of them. He should have remembered that if you deny me here on earth, I'll deny you before the angels of God in heaven. That's the time he should have remembered. And the second person came, temptation came, he denied the Lord. And the third time he denied the Lord, and now Jesus looked at him, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you that may sift you like wheat, but have prayed for you. He forgot that Jesus had said that Satan wanted to a kind of a sift him like wheat, but eventually he remembered, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which he said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly, not just wept, not cockerel tears, he wasn't weeping to impress anybody. He wasn't weeping to attract sympathy. He was weeping because he actually saw that he had done what he shouldn't have done. And it says he wept bitterly. That's the kind of brokenness. And that is the kind of repentance that brings a person out of sin and bring sin to the Savior. We come to point number two here. Point number two, we're looking at profitable patience for triumph over trials. In James chapter 1 verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying trial of your faith worketh patience. When we read the scriptures, we look at the scripture, and then we compare what we read with our personal lives. Have you gone through trials before? Yes. Have you gone through challenges before? Yes. Has your faith been tried before? Yes. But the next question is, has it worked patience in your life? Perseverance in your life? As it wrought a kind of work in you, the people will say, looks like this brother has improved. He's not as impatient as he used to be. He's not as boisterous as he used to be. He's not as self-confident as he used to be. Looks like the trial, the, ch the challenges, that this sister has gone through, has made her true. You know, she's not as quick as she used to be. She's not as fast as she used to be. Now, she walks slowly. She's more matured. The trials that came, the challenges that came, has changed her demeanor, her, her conduct. A disposition. Now she walks quietly. She is not as loud as she used to be, boisterous as she used to be, acting like a militant man as she used to be. She's softened because of what she's gone through. That's what the trial ought to do in our lives, knowing not this that the trying, the trial of your faith, walketh. Patience, we're looking at profitable patience, perseverance for triumph over trials. Three things we're looking at. Number one, number one, perceiving the test of faith in our trials. When trials come, that you understand this is a test. 
we've been going through studies they've been going through classes we've been through going through programs now at the end of the teaching and the exhortation and the classes we've been having uh, we're going for test now and you understand this is to test and if you are tested you must remember everything you have learned in the class and as we go through test in life we we'll bring back to mind everything we have learned from the time of salvation to sanctification to Holy Ghost baptism and to the time of studying the Word of God, perceiving the test of faith in our trials. Number two, preserving the testimony of the faithful during trial. I have a testimony. And I must keep that testimony. Look at this trial. The trial wants to make a mess of my profession. The trial wants to make a, a, a mess of my testimony. I'm saved. Great testimony. I'm sanctified. And I follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord. And Satan has heard my testimony. He wants to make a mess rubbish of my testimony. And so I know that. And I perceive that. And I want to preserve the testimony of the faithful during my trials. Number three, progressing in our tasks to the full despite trials uh, you don't uh, you know the, before the trials came up you were galloping you are you know have been the tip the, the, the peak of the mountain in mind and you are saying i am getting there i am going there now trials come and there's no progress anymore trials come and then we cannot do what we promised what we consecrated we're going to do no you're so careful you're so watchful that you are making progress of the task that the Lord has given you to the full despite the trials. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at perceiving the test in all our trials, the test of faith. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1. We're reading from verse 7. In First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 7, that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perishes. Think about the people that mine gold and they put them inside the furnace and they heat until it becomes liquid until they can see their image on the molten gold and they keep on doing that then they bring it out and make it to the shape they want it to be and that's about a faith a faith is so precious precious of the lord and precious for getting to heaven that even though it is tried it is so that all the dirty things all the oars o-r-e all the oars may be out of that of that faith that there is it and it says the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ at the appearing of Christ before the Lord comes even though your faith is tried your faith will not be burnt up and your faith will keep on shining be, keep on being purified until he comes you know you're wondering uh, uh, this uh, kind of family i have why is my wife doing like this okay i will divorce her if you do that you do not understand the trying of your faith that the trial is to make your faith perfect until the appearing of the Lord. Why is this man acting to me like this? Looks like maybe he has another eye outside. Maybe he's, uh, you know, somebody is attracting his attention. All right. If he's interested in somebody else outside, I really see him. I divorce him. Your faith has been tried 
and you are not overcoming and the faith now is burnt up and it is not remaining until the appearing of Christ. But when you say, whatever they do, whatever they say, however the in-laws behave, however the man himself behaves, is coming, you know, home now later than usual. Whatever he does, he may say, I'm going to give up faith. I'm going to give up the teaching of one man, one woman, until that do us part. No, I will not give up. And when he comes, I greet him with a smile. I don't get angry. I don't begin a fight. If you get angry and begin a fight, it's like you're like him. You're losing your faith. But when you stand, and you stand in faith, that whatever he does, whatever she does, you're able to keep your conviction. And you're able to keep on loving him like Christ wants you to love your wife or to love your husband. Then your faith being tried like trying gold with fire is standing. Your faith will stand in Jesus' name. And if you're here, sister so-and-so has packed out of her home. Yes, she had trial in that home, but she was not able to stand. Her faith had been tried. The faith was burnt up. If you hear that uh, brother so-and-so has, you know, packed out of the house and is not able to stay, it's because he has trial in that home. And because of the trial in the home, the faith is burnt up. He cannot stand. I will stand. I will stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. That's how we know the brethren. That's how we know the believers. That's how we know the people who really believe in the Lord. And during time of trial, temptation, test, they remain, they remain firm until the very end, until the appearance of Christ. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says over here, whom have we not seen? Ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, ye be yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Have you ever rejoiced with joy unspeakable? When you maybe when you have a child, joy unspeakable. When you have a husband, joy unspeakable. When you have a wife, joy unspeakable. When you've got a new job, joy unspeakable. When you go out and a land that somebody sends something large, money large into account, joy unspeakable. Hi, but when there's trial, difficulty. What is challenge? How about when, you know, things, you know, you cannot make ends meet? How about when people ridicule you? And when people insult you, assault you, do you have that same kind of joy? That's where sanctification lies. That even though you have those challenges, yet you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Receiving the end of your faith, the purpose of your faith, the reason for your faith, even the salvation of of your soul. We're looking at chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 12. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you. Consider it not a strange thing. Uh, I wonder what's happening. Uh, I'm still in the church, we're still in the church, and we're still hearing the same word of God. And this person keeps coming and keeps coming to the church. And yet, look at what he's doing to me. Look at what she's doing to me. And then you begin to judge. I did not hear him. I pitied the pastor preaching and preaching all his heart out. And these people are still doing like this to me. You're pitying yourself. You're pitying yourself that even though you come to church, and you're expecting people should look like this and do like this. Look at the way they are acting. You're pitching yourself. But it said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the furry trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, but rejoice. 
in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In verse 14, in verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, you are saying, I thank God I'm saved. I thank God I'm living the victorious life. I thank God because I don't have any, you know, any debts on my hand. I do not have any other property, anybody's money in my pocket. I'm, you know, I'm living above board. I'm living above reproach. And yet, this comes to you. It says, if you be reproached. For the name of Christ. You say, what have I done? I've examined my life. I've examined my attitude. I've examined everything I do. I've not done anything wrong. And yet they reproach me. And then uh, you're sorrowful. You're moody. You hang your head. And you, you don't associate with anybody. There's no socializing with anybody. The, the good I do, the better I do things, and the more I approach them with the love of Christ, the more they still reproach me. You are not having a right attitude. Look at this. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Not moody, not withdrawn, not isolated. Not planning to do evil. Okay, I've done good and they do that. I think what they expect is that I shall strike them back. Okay, I'll strike them back. There you are. You lose your faith. But it says, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. He, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part... He is glorified. Amen. We're looking at verse 15 there. In verse 15, it says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busy body in other men's matters. Verse 16. In verse 16, yet, if any man, any believer, any, any woman suffer as a Christian, as a Christian, uh -uh. do Christians suffer? Yes, we suffer persecution. Yes, we suffer misinterpretation. We suffer misunderstanding. We suffer the uh, kind of carnality of people and the childishness of people. You know, there are childish people. They are thoughtless people. They don't think of their action. All they do is just to please themselves. They want to please their flesh and please their thought. And we suffer as a result of that. And yet we keep our ground and we hold our ground. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. Your glorify God. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at preserving the testimony of the faithful during trials. During trials, you want to preserve whatever testimony you've given in the past. Since I came to know the Lord by the grace of God, I've been living consistently. Keep that testimony. During your trial, since I came to know the Lord, praise the Lord, no shady deals has come in my hand. And whatever money comes, if it is blood money, I reject. I'm not so eager for gifts and for money that I will soil my hands. If that's the testimony you have been given at the time of trial, are you out of job now? Are you penniless now? Keep the testimony that you have always got that I'm not, you know, so eager to get give from anybody that I overlook their lifestyle. I overlook the work they do. I overlook the things they do. I'm not so eager for flattery. 
that I will just accept whatever people are saying. If they're saying something, something wrong and they're putting you on the pedestal, when you know that you have not been there, but you're so hungry for flattery that whatever they say, you just accept, you lose your testimony. But you keep your testimony. He doesn't care for that. He doesn't worry about that. He doesn't mind whatever, whatever happens. He has a testimony of the faithful to protect, preserving the testimony of the faithful during trials. In Romans chapter 5, looking at verse 3, Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 3, and not only so, but with glory in temptations also. You know, as we read about all these Christians, whether it's Peter, whether it's Paul, whether it's James, all they are telling us is that don't be so moody and don't be so withdrawn and don't be so isolated and don't be so emotional. It says all of them telling us we joy, we rejoice and we glory. It says and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation walketh patience. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, and patience experience. It says, that's how we get experience to live in all conditions. That's how we get experience to live with all kinds of people. And yet, we're able to live the Christian life. We might be in Judah, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We live the life we ought to live. We might come to Babylon, and things are different in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to threaten this or that yet we're consistent the way we ought to live so that we're having experience experience in every state of life every situation in life every area of our lives no matter who we're living with uh, since you became a christian you might have lived with you know some people that you are familiar with then later you came to another place and you're living there and they didn't understand you at the beginning how would they understand because they didn't understand what vows you had made what consecrations you have made what commitments you have made and because they didn't understand, uh, they walked by sight and not by faith, and they kind of injured you one way or the other. But you're having experience, experience, experience every time, uh, no matter what is happening. And patience works experience, and experience hope. Then in verse 5, uh, in verse 5 it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shared abroad, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at progressing in our tasks to the full despite trials. Progressing in the tax he has given us and we progress to the full. We're not stopping halfway. I cannot do that because the trials are too many. I'm trying to nurse my wound. I'm trying to treat myself. I'm trying to, you know, get above all these tummy waters. So I cannot do anything now. It says we we'll keep on making progress in our task to the full, despite the trials. We're looking at um, Acts chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. It tells us in verse 24, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. They talk of their lives, their self-esteem, their self-respect, Oh, they say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I must protect my self-esteem. I must protect my self-respect. And if I come across anyone that doesn't show respect, and he looked down, belittled me, I have to defend that. No, Paul the Apostle said, 
none of those things move me neither count i my life my honor my self-respect my self-esteem dear unto myself so that i might finish my cause with joy 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 again that he is paul the apostle said if i begin to look at them and look at their faces and take in their action if i begin to look at that uh, i may still be walking i may still be you know running here running there but it will not be with joy paul the apostle said none of these things move me neither count i my life dear unto myself that i might finish my course with joy and the ministry which i have received of the lord jesus and to testify of the gospel of the grace of god i pray that this same attitude and mindset the lord will give everyone in jesus name in second corinthians chapter 4 second corinthians chapter 4 we're looking at verse 1 therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy we faint not seeing we have received this ministry paul the apostle saying me of all people i persecuted the church and i did many things against this name of christ that he even saved me forgave me that would have been enough but that he saved me he sanctified me he gave me the power baptizing me the holy ghost and he called me into ministry me of all people he said i've received this ministry and i have this ministry i faint not what could have made him to faint look at verse 8 in verse 8 he says we are troubled on every side it says i go there and i thought maybe because i was in location a that's why i had the trouble i come to location b and i'm troubled i say okay then i go to location c and the same trouble why <laughs> paul you know more than i do satan is everywhere satan is in location a location b location d he goes to and fro and he follows you everywhere and so he said we're troubled on every side yet not distressed we're perplexed but not in despair look at verse 9 in verse 9 persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed and then in verse 16 in verse 16 it says for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day Day. And then in verse 17, it says, For our light affliction, shipwreck, light affliction, false brethren, um, it's light affliction, and all the things they want. They even stoned him somewhere. And it says, All is light affliction, but uh, for our light affliction, which is for a moment, work it for us, if I'm more exceeding an eternal wage of glory. How? Look at verse. 18 it says while we look not at the things which are seen it says i don't look at those things you know after being stoned all the stones around he said i don't look at them it's like when a snake has beaten somebody and the poison of the snake is in the flesh instead of looking for a bandage to bandage that thing so you can restrict the poison of the snake he leaves the poison there and is looking for the snake and looking for the snake and meanwhile the poison is going through to the rest of the body until it gets to the heart of the man don't do that when something like that has happened don't look at the snake and don't look for the snake look for the solution 
he said while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen the grace of god that's what we're looking at the glory of god that's what we're looking at and the promises of god that's what we're looking at and it says for the things which are seen a temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 1 in hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 1 it says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience perseverance the race that is set before us look at verse 2 in verse 2 it says it says uh, looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who oh, for the joy the joy the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of god look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners sinners will contradict themselves they're still sinners they still say negative things but the negative things they are saying to show their own truth they are contradictory and yet jesus endured the contradiction of sinners against themselves lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds look at verse 4 in verse 4 ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin look at verse 14 in verse 14 follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord in verse 28 in verse 28 it says wherefore we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God accepted acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at prevailing prayer of the triumphant over tribulations. In James chapter one, reading from verse four, it says, and let patience have a perfect work that she may be perfect and entire wanting nothing lacking nothing three things we're looking at number one number one we're looking at patiently perfecting our faith against tribulations number two prayerfully prevailing by faith over all tribulations number three purposefully proclaiming the faith the spicing tribulations look at number one number one patiently perseveringly perfecting our faith against tribulations it tells us in um, in um, john chapter 16 verse 33 in john chapter 16 verse 33 this says have i spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have a tribulation in the world ye shall have a tribulation why would god permit that in the world ye shall have a tribulation you know our constitution is such that if the world is so friendly and the world is so cool and the world is so nice and the world is so understanding our constitution has the tendency of going more and more into the world they love me they like me they appreciate me they take care of me they praise me they flatter me and so we forget ourselves so god allows the world to be the world and when the world shows you their side then if you are trying to you know fall for them and love them and and be like them you have question you're told that world is like you know there's tribulation in the world there's trial in the world and you 
gets you back to prayer. It gets you back to the Lord. It says in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He has overcome the world. Your world in particular that may try to press you up and that may try to soak you in and get the good thing out of you. It makes them to show their true colors so that you will, you will say, I don't think I ought to be too much there. I don't think I need to spend quality time there. I think I need to come back to prayer and come back to my chambers and come back to the throne of grace because out there there's too much fire burning. There is too much tribulation. And we come to the Lord. And in the Lord we have the triumph. We're looking at number two here. Number two, we're looking at prayerfully prevailing by faith over all tribulations. In Acts chapter 14, reading from verse 22. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God the God of this world will not make it too easy for you to okay um, you are brother so and so okay go ahead have not bothered you you want to go to heaven and I don't have the chance to get to that heaven. You want to make it to glory, and I don't have the chance to move to glory. Okay, I envy you, but go ahead. Satan will never do that. He wants to make it as tough as possible, as difficult as possible, because he knows you are born again joyfully. You are traveling to glory. It's going to bring temptation. That's why it says that Paul the apostle confirmed the souls of the brethren and he says uh, that they should continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. I will enter. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation. The very first thing he mentioned, he said, uh, there are things trying to separate us, wanting to separate us, endeavoring and making all efforts to separate us from Christ, from the love of Christ. He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. In verse 36, it says, as it is reaching for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accountable a sheep for slaughter. Verse 37, it says, Nay, in all these things were more than conquerors. In all these things, not outside these things, in all these things, in the tribulation, in the persecution, in the necessities and the things that come across our way, in all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Verse 39, it says, Nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of, of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. We're looking at number three here. Number three, purposefully proclaiming the faith, despising tribulations. Purposefully proclaiming the faith, the faith that saves, the faith that prepares the hearers for heaven. Purposefully proclaiming that despising belittling all those tribulations and trials and troubles and temptations. In Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 16, but rise 
and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Always remember why Christ appeared unto you, the purpose for this purpose. Always remember why you heard the message of salvation and you were saved for this purpose. Always remember why he called you to be his servant, to be a soul winner, to be a minister, to be a preacher of the word. Always remember, and Paul the apostle always remembered, he said, I remember the Lord said unto me, Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and uh, inheritance among them uh, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Look at verse 19. Uh, it says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He appeared unto me. I heard him. He gave me a commission. And he told me what to do, proclaiming the faith that will save the people, the Gentiles, and whatever tribulation, I despise them. O King Agrippa, I have not been disobedient unto the heavenly vision. The same grace that Paul the Apostle had, he had grant unto you in Jesus name and the same for, foresight and the same fervency and the same passion and the same perseverance following the Lord and proclaiming the faith with purpose of mind cleaving to the Lord the Lord grant unto you in Jesus name let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer let's take what he has taught us today to the Lord in prayer there are temptations but the grace of God is sufficient for you there are trials but the grace of God is sufficient sufficient for you. There are tribulations too, but the grace of God is sufficient unto you. Why don't you just call on the Lord and say, Lord, you helped others. You will help me. What have you had today? What have you learned today? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Have a proper perception of the temptations you might have. Be vigilant. Be sober. And don't take things for granted perception in times of temptation you know that temptations come to believers and you have that profitable perseverance you're patient you're triumphant in your trials talk to the Lord pray unto him get a strength the might, the power by which you will overcome. Prevailing prayer. That's what makes us triumphant. Praying, claiming the promises of God. He made others overcome. And he'll make you overcome. Common temptation that comes to all men and it makes a way to escape you're thoughtful you think of your eternal destiny you won't allow any temptation to take eternal life from you it's a test of faith when you're going through a test you concentrate. Your minds will not be here and there. Perceiving the test of faith in our trials. 
and you are joyful. You don't go around with long face, gloomy face, isolating yourself. lonely and being alone avoiding the people test and you're so in deal to preserve your testimony the testimony of the faithful Remember what victory you had in the past? What commitment you had in the past? What consecration, concentration you had in the past? And what testimonies people are giving about you? About your constancy, your consistency. So persevere in whatever you are going through now so that you'll preserve that testimony of the faithful. Are you making progress in the task the Lord has given you to the full despite the trials? You are not say I'm going through much because of that. I'm so discouraged. I cannot move on. No, that's not you. That's not your life. Despise the trials. Overlook the trials. Belittle the trials. Don't make the devil or the followers of Satan feel they can be so strong as to hinder you, as to impede, slow down your journey. Don't allow the tempter to feel is stronger than your helper, stronger than the Christ who lives in you. Don't give any human being of flesh and blood the wrong notion that they are higher, stronger than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in your life. Lift Jesus higher, higher than the God of this world. Patiently, you are perfecting your faith, increasing your faith, growing your faith against all tribulations. Prayerfully, you prevail by faith over all temptations and trials and tribulations. When last did you smile at the storm? When last did you laugh at the tempter, at the temptress? When last did you exude joy, excitement, happiness in the face of trial and tribulation? When last did you have joy unspeakable in the midst of trial? Have you proclaimed the faith this year? 
Have you preached the gospel this year? Have you excitedly, passionately, joyfully, cheerfully declared the gospel this year? Or are you drawn back by, I don't have this, I don't have that? You are showing a gloomy face to the devil. And he is rejoicing that he can make you miserable. The joy you ought to have, you pass it on to the hand of the devil. Take it back. Joy. Gladness. Happiness. Take it back. And serve the Lord joyfully. Proclaiming the gospel. Following up on the converts. Serving the Lord with joy. Don't allow that unbelieving wife. To, to feel she can make you cry. You come back from church, you hear the exciting message of the word of God, and then a sinful woman, unbelieving woman, will think that she can take the joy of the Lord away from your heart. Don't allow her to feel triumphant overpowering you. Be happy while we look at things which are not seen and we jettison. We overlook the things which are seen. Don't allow the unbelieving man to think he is so mighty and that his own attitude can be so disturbing as to make you forget the joy you just got in the house of God. Don't allow any mortal man, any mortal woman to have the wrong notion that I can do anything that will take the grace, the joy, the happiness, the gladness of the Lord away from your heart. Live with joy. Live with gladness and happiness. Lift up the consecration you are making to the Lord. Take that higher than any circumstance in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord has answered your prayer. Father, we thank you, we appreciate you. Thank you for calling us into the faith. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our experience in the Lord. We're asking, Lord, that the joy of salvation will remain and abide in every saved soul in Jesus' name. Those who have not been saved, Lord, I pray that at this time, they'll have the repentance of a broken heart. Turn away from sin. Give up all the evil in their hands and have uh, the real salvation that brings joy, that brings transformation, that brings new life into every one of us in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray the grace to overcome, the grace to endure, 
and the grace to keep on abiding in the Lord, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, whatever the tribulation, grant the grace to everyone in Jesus' name. When temptations come, Lord, make us so sober, so vigilant that we receive steadfast in the faith in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that the victory, the triumph of a real child of God, that nothing will take away the victory, the triumph you have given us. Grant us that grace and that strength and that power in Jesus' name. We're going back home. Watch over every one of us. All the brethren here, all the brethren everywhere, as we go back to our homes, your promises will be yes and amen. amen. The victory will be definite. The triumph will be definite. And Lord, when we come back again, we'll come back with testimony. Amen. That the things that used to put our back on the wall, now we are standing. Amen. The things that used to cause depression and distress and sorrow that now we're so happy and excited we're living the victorious life happily and joyfully in jesus name and help us lord to bring other people to this same joy to this same victory and to this same triumph and we come with them to the next fellowship in our districts and to a combined service in jesus name all that you have promised and purpose for every one of your children this year. Blessing upon blessing. Amen. Victory upon victory. Amen. And Lord, your promises will be yes and amen in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Confirm it in every life. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.